Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jiggs Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, hop on over to Amazon and pick one up. We'll be glad you did. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your continued interest and support. Featured in this episode is Greg Arico, original drummer for the group many consider the greatest and certainly one of the most innovative funk rock soul bands of all time, Sly and the Family Stone. He sat behind the kit for Sly from 1966 to 1971 and was featured on the group's five landmark albums plus a compilation. They were A Whole Nother Thing, Dance to the Music, Life, Stand, Greatest Hits, and There's a Riot Going On. In addition to the title hits of many of those records, they also included the classic tracks, You Can Make It If You Try, Everyday People, I Want to Take You Higher, Hot Fun in the Summertime, Everybody's a Star, Family Affair, Single Simple Song, and uh, Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself Again. With her mixed race and gender lineup, ferocious grooves, and positive and socially relevant lyrics, Sign the Family Stone surged to the head of the pack as a late 1960s supergroup, and rival Jimi Hendrix as a showstopper at the legendary Woodstock Music Festival. While the group blended many musical styles, their biggest influence was in funk, further building on concepts first put forth by James Brown to take the genre to new places and new levels. Those sounds echo throughout the 1970s and beyond through the voices and instruments of just about every funk-oriented band that followed in Sly and the Family Stone's wake. Here, Enrico reflects back on sitting front and center for that amazing ride and the majesty of it all. He also talks about their drug-fueled downfall, gets into his subsequent career playing with other legends like the Grateful Dead, Santana, Weather Report, and David Bowie, and about reuniting with some old bandmates to bring that amazing music back to audiences as a family stone and are still touring and doing it today. So it's turning all the way back to the mid-1960s for some hot fun in the truth and rhythm time with Mr. Greg Arico. I'm delighted to welcome to Truth and Rhythm drummer and producer Greg Erico, the original timekeeper for funk rock soul giants Sly and the Family Stone from 1966 to 1971. He then went on to play, perform, and produce familiar names like Weather Report, David Bowie, Santana, Grateful Dead, Betty Davis, Bill Wyman, and Lee Oscar. Greg remains active today, including performing with the Family Stone. Greg, how are you? Pretty good, Scott. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. Yeah, good to be here. And uh, here now is, as usual, in the Bay Area, correct? Uh, yeah, I live just north of San Francisco. I was born and raised here in San Francisco. Proper. And yeah. This is my life. I was in New York for a quick minute. Uh, we stayed there back in the day when we first started the group about six months and then i was in la for a while but uh, this is home to get home i like it up there very much yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so um want to uh jump back a little bit before getting into the sly stuff and just find a little bit about you know how you first got into into music and drumming and then leading up to actually meeting sly um well, i started playing when i was 14 and um, I had wanted to start before that, but I didn't have, uh, you know, encouragement around the house. My folks really didn't want the, uh, um, you know, there's, there's all this noise around the house being at drums, right? So when I was 14, I got my first set and I started playing. And uh, I think at 16, I had met. Freddie Stone, um, Sly's brother, we had a group for about a year. And then from that, we went into Sly and the Family Stone, which Sly had <clears throat> handpicked um, a handful of people, you know, including us. And actually, the day that uh, we started the group, December 1966, the group, and I had showed up at the house. For rehearsal with, with, with Freddie and I, you know, it's called the 
Brown sauce. And uh, Freddie hadn't told me that they had already kind of moved along, and this was the day that we had planned. Uh, was keeping it as a surprise, I guess. This was the day we had planned to meet everybody and talk and start the group. And Sly had made some prior attempts to start and uh, put some musical together that didn't work. So this was this was the one, you know, he had hand picked everybody. But how did you actually meet Freddie, though? Uh, Freddie, I met from, um, there was a fellow by the name of Leon Patilla. He had, he's a vocalist in, played Hammer B3. He had a group called The Sensations. I think it was, this, yeah, Leon Leon and Sensations, I think it was. Anyway, um, he had called me, well, he would call me once in a while to sit in when his drummer was sick and whatever. And this night I was about to leave to go out and um, it was a Friday night and the phone rang just before I had my hand on the door ready to go out the door. And he, he asked me to come down and he had a gig that evening, would you, you know, say me, you know, <laughs> his name, his drummer was named Greg too. Anyway, Greg sick, could you come down and help me out? So I went, I said, yeah, sure. I threw my drums in the car and I went down and played this gig with him. It was at the YMCA in San Francisco. Um, it was the y I think it was the YMCA, yeah, it was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, so that, Freddie was sitting in with him that night too. So we, we met that night. We talked a little bit. Then within a couple of weeks, there was another show that he had asked me to do. Freddie was there again. And we, we really got into it, started talking. He was talking, he was saying he wanted to start a group. And, you know, would I be interested in, 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 you know, working with them? And I said, yeah. And so we got into it and that's, we started the Stone Souls. That went for a little over a year. And then we started Slime the Bang with Stone. What what kind of uh, material were you playing at that point? Oh, it was funk. It was uh, rhythm and blues, funk. You know, uh, time I had a radio show during this period. He was a he was successful record producer, and he had a radio show, and um, he had a great radio show. So you know he had pretty bigger than life personality on there in the Bay Area and he played it was all R and B cult it was soul music then, right? And uh so I had already, you know, knew him from the show and uh I met him once at a few, couple of things we met, but no really elaborate conversation or anything like that. And so when this came down I was, you know, I was excited about it and we were pleased to do it. And, you know, we all were actually. Actually, the first night we we, we talked, when we met that evening, um, we didn't even play any music. We just talked. It's kind of an, it, for that, this is mid 60s, right? And um, for a musical entity, especially a popular musical entity to get together that had, you know, black, white, male, and female was an extremely unusual thing. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I don't think it existed. And so, you know, we talked about all the aspects and ramifications of those, which didn't bother any of us at all. And um, we're excited about doing it, you know, so. Was that part of uh, Sly's vision though? Uh, or did it just come by coincidence that it was a, a mix of, of races and genders? I don't think, I think it was part of his vision. I think he, you know, having, ha having, uh, he made a few attempts at, at putting a group together, a musical entity together. that wasn't anything that I guess inspired him, you know, and he just, he, so when he did, so this was kind of, I think, a conscious um, effort on his part to kind of put something unusual and to challenge I guess the status quo and to challenge things, whether it be musically, socially, you know, and just figuring just in doing that. And um, you were going to get something unusual and different out of that. And I say it worked. Was was the name talked about at that meeting or where, where, when did the name come out? No, no, not right away. Yeah, we, we got into that like later. We, we started the next week straight we rehearsed and we started playing and about a week later I, we actually got our first gig 
Um, and um, so we, uh, during that period, we talked about what the name would be. And when you came in there, um, coming into that Sly situation, who were some drummers that had sort of influenced or inspired you to that point? Um, I was, I remember one of my first inspirations was actually Buddy Rich. Mm. Yeah, I had seen him in a place called Basin Street West in San Francisco. It was a relatively small venue. And he came in there with a big band and it was just amazing. You know? I was sitting right next to him just about. And um, hands of lightning, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He had the left hand, you know, from uh, the other side of the universe. Uh, and it was, and uh, so, you know, he was one of my early influences. And I, you know, growing up in San Francisco, that was, which is an intersection of the world, you know, you know, like New York and London and sort of people from all different cultures. So there was a lot of music here. And I was exposed to a lot of music. And um, so, you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot of influences which came into play um, in being part of the group because we drew from a lot of different genres and, you know, did our own thing with it. Did you have a natural affinity for, you know, soul and funk as well as, you know, rock and jazz or whatever? Yeah, I, I just liked, I liked good music, you know. Um, I remember when I first started playing, it was a fellow across the street from me. And so my first couple of gigs was playing, he played an accordion. And so we did weddings, you know. I played with him and we did polkas and whatever. Mm -hmm wedding songs you know so that was my first couple of gigs uh I didn't, I didn't i don't think that that would have uh, kept my interest for very long but i mean i did it and you know i had fun doing it and, yeah. that's funny that you bring that up i don't i've never said this on the show for sure but you know i was a, a disc jockey for a long time and i had a mobile disc jockey company and for a while i was doing events where i had partnered up with a guy that played accordion Oh, so yeah. we, did, we did some weddings and he would rove around playing his accordion uh, yeah. for one part and then I would play, you know, wedding and dance music for the other part. So it's funny that you bring that up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you guys got together, you did your first show and um, what was the vibe like? You know, was it just, uh, you know, electric chemistry right away? Oh, yeah. The vibe was good. I mean... You know, we were, of course, uh, the first music that we played was in order for us to get some gigs and start playing. We had to, you know, top 40, more or less, right? And, uh, but we did discuss the fact that whatever we did, we would flip it up a little bit, you know, make it our own. We'd make and make those songs that we played our own. So it was it was unique from the get go, and then uh, the thought was later on down the road, which wasn't too far down, within a couple of months, and we started doing injecting original material in the set you know, as we garnered a fan base locally. And, you know, so we play. So I mean, you know, you you go to a, you go to a club owner, you know, oh, what are you guys playing? You know, what's it sound like? You know, you're gonna to have to tell him something that he could relate to, right? And and in the audience too. So because it was it at first, you know, uh, you're introducing your new your new tunes. People never heard the stuff, you know. So, and <clears throat> I guess uh, even early on, you're still crafting, you know, the arrangements and and the songs even to. You know, do stuff that the people could relate to, and you know, that just connects. It's a process. Yeah. Now, but, were you, you and Jerry were cousins? Is that true or no? Uh, uh, but they th this was a record company idea of to that we should, I guess, maybe uh, because of the name Sly and the Family Stone, and there were, were brothers and sisters in the group. You yeah. know, the Stewart side uh, that we did. It would be nice that we all had some kind of a, a you know, family relationship. So they made we weren't really cousins. 
Oh, okay. Like, yeah. I had never heard that until recently, actually. And I was like, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What was your first impression of Sly as a, as a, as a musician, as a creative force, as a, as a guy? My first impression was, uh, well, he was brilliant. You know, like I said, he had a, he had a great radio show, big personality, you know, he knew his music, uh, he was hip, creative, he had great, uh, even the radio show, he, he would uh, sing the commercials sometimes and, you know, I mean, he was quite a character. So I knew that musically, this is going to be fun. You know, this is going to be, it's going to be fresh. It's going to be new and different. It's going to be challenging. And uh, also, he had, he was a successful producer already. He had teamed up with Tom Donahue and Bobby Mitchell, and Tom Donahue being the, the father of FM, AR format, FM radio. He started KSAN. And um, AOR being album oriented, you know, radio. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the one who started all that. Before that, the KYA was a station, it was a big network station, an AM radio network station, which was the thing back then. Okay, so <clears throat> they had a label, it's called Autumn Records. And so I had a hit with Bobby Freeman, a song called The Swim. It was right around the time Chubby Checker, you know, right around then. Yeah. He had also produced uh, Grace Slick, who was with Jefferson Airplane. Uh, great society and uh, a group called the Bob Rummels, who our first manager uh, also managed. His name was Richard Manello. He was our first manager and he also owned the club, which was our first gig. We were still playing. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to play after hours uh, and before hours and, and after hours, like from three to six in the morning. Mm -hmm. Developed pretty good following there. Matter of fact, that's where the AR people from Epic, CBS, seen us, and who was responsible for us getting signed. Which was going to be my next question: is how the record deal came down, yeah. and, and how long had you had you been together when you got that deal? Oh, it started. We started. It came up on the table about six months in, into the group. So. December 66, so somewhere in the middle of 67. And by, the end, by the end of 67, we had uh, already recorded um, and finished the whole new thing. Which was a thing yeah, I was, I was going to say, there it is. That's it. Yeah. yeah, so that came very quickly after you guys got signed. Relatively. It seemed like a long time for us, you know. <laughs> we're, we're itching to get going, right? Yeah, it's really, you know, the, the most, the majority of the body of work was done in the first five years. Uh, I left in 71, so I did a Riot after that and Fresh, which were two good records. Um, I have some tracks on Riot, uh, the, we, the tracks that we had recorded before I left the group, and then he had finished them later on. And, up on that record and, and then Larry left the group about a year after that 72. So most of that work was was done in those first five, six years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a whole a whole new thing. I mean it was so appropriately titled, you know. Um exactly. Yeah. What uh what was the, the reaction out of the gate to this one? Uh it was not commercially successful. And and it it that record didn't really become relevant to probably decades later. And so I, you know, I remember Dave Kaplick, who ended up being our manager and was the fellow responsible for signing this with Clive Davis. Um, he made a comment once saying, "Yeah, you know, we shipped, you know, slide delivered." A whole new thing and we shipped and we actually got more returned than we shipped <laughs> you know so it was not commercially successful although it did get some radio play but it was it was probably over it was over the heads of most people at that time you know and not till 
we had commercial success, that artists actually, and, and I got to say this though, during that time when it was first released, artists would have it, you know, musicians would have it. Mm -hmm. The average cat on the street, you know, it did not connect. Musicians understood it because it was very musical. And then uh, later on, after success, you know, in, uh, late seventies and more or less more eighties and nineties, it you know was sampled and you know, mm -hmm. all kind. I mean, hundreds of rap artists and hip hop artists sampled and took grooves off of that record. Yeah. Yeah. So on that first record, did you guys get out of the Bay Area at all to perform based on that, or were you still oh, yeah. still? Yeah, no, we 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 did the first um, almost six months. We were up here, and then we went down to Vegas. We had an opportunity to go down to Vegas, so we went and we actually lived there for a couple months, and played extensively down there, and then went to New York and toured out of the East Coast because when we had got signed. Um, then the like Roy Morse agency and um, it was the booking agency and you know everything was everything was in New York so we had to kind of like be there that was our home base for a while and then we toured out of out of East Coast. So we did some stuff. What what were some of the uh, early uh, bills that we might know of the other artists that you were teamed up with at that at that time in the early stages? I, I don't understand the question. In the in the early tours, early uh, road trips that you guys took, what were some of the other acts that were on some of the bills that we would have heard oh, of? Okay. See, um, I remember, you know, there was everything from the Fifth Dimension, mm -hmm. the, one of our first um, auditorium concert appearances was in Detroit with the fifth dimension. So from that to like uh, Chicago, uh, Love and Spoonful, I think we did, um, we do something with the Vanilla Fudge or that might've been just, the, I think we played in their manager's club in Long Island once. Remember, there. Ended up knowing all the guys later on. Uh, yeah, that's what I remember. Like at the very first, other acts that we'd be on. We played a lot of clubs too at first. You know, the circuit, the circuit. But that's what most people carved out, you know. And then you start getting in later on in the 80s, and I mean, not the 80s, late in the 70s, like 78, 79. Then you start having all the big festivals and all the outdoor festivals started happening. Including Woodstock, sixty-nine. Yeah, you guys must have blew the roof off of the clubs. Uh, it was intense. Yeah, <laughs> it was good. I mean, the band live was was amazing. Um, you know, we had, we had our own sound. We had, and it was it was uh, it, it was a lot of fun performing. I mean, I always enjoyed because we had always would. We'd always play this stuff a little bit differently too, you know. We always so it, it was always fun. It wasn't just like, and you know, you had to learn how to, you know, making records was one thing. Making good records was was one set of chops, and then performing them live was actually another to really do it right. Meaning that sometimes there was a song, or there were songs that you re, that you performed verbatim as you recorded them. Sometimes they didn't work live like that. So you had to, you had to, you had to rip it up again and 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 figure out what's going to make this song come across live. And uh, the band was able to do that very well. Did did you tend to uh, come up with some of the material at shows that later got laid down in studio, or not necessarily? Um. Yeah, I mean, probably all the above. I mean, you know, we used to go in and cut tracks with just, you know, a line or an idea. And uh, a lot of times in Sly would write, the lyric would come from maybe the track. 
And then it also happened the other way around. You have an idea for, you know, for a song, and maybe it was more specific. But a lot of times, you know, the stuff would would come along and morph and develop as we did it. I, I don't part- remember particularly any um, tracks where we did. I think most of it was we created in the studio, and then we went and created live performances of mm-hmm. songs. What were some of the early reactions to the group? Might have- what, what were some of the early reactions to the group? Um, you know, seeing that it was, you know, between the sound and the, and the appearance and the dynamic mix of the members and was, were, were some crowds taken a little aback or was it, uh, you know, an immediate embrace kind of it, thing? It was both. I mean, there's, there were times where they were taken back by it. It was like, you know, everyone's like, they don't know what to think or what to do, how to react. It just kind of sitting there. And there was times where it was like, you know, they just ate it up. So I, I would say we had both experiences. You know, I remember playing in the very early times. Uh, we play, and there were t- three people in the audience. <laughs> but I got to say that we played just as fierce with the three people in the audience as we did if there were three hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. And and. The movement through that time went relatively quickly. You know, things were moving fast in those days. Yeah. Well, records came out so quickly too. I mean, you guys came back with this one so quickly after that one. Yeah. Um, and of course, big hit, dance to the music. Music, yeah. Um, how did things change and how did you guys feel about you know getting radio play and getting that kind of recognition? I remember the first time I heard dance and music on the radio. Matter of fact, we were all in the car. We were on the road at the time. And we turned the radio on, and there it was. And we just, I mean, <laughs> it's good you weren't anywhere near that car because the car was like, you know, all over the road. <laughs> we were yelling and screaming. We were excited. So <clears throat> it was nice, you know. It was good to, it, it made a big difference in getting commercial success. And, uh, and doing your live shows too, because now there's something that you know, it's it's creating. So you, it, it's kind of like the line in front of the club, you know, and how they like they do in New York. Like if you want to pack a club, well, you, there's nobody in it, but there's a line outside. You create a line. You create excitement. You create. Oh, how come everybody wants to go there? How come everybody's listening to this? And so that that generates more activity and more, you know more interest and in, so you get this inertia going you get a buzz yeah Build yeah, a yeah. Buzz. yeah so the first experience was you know that of having a hit record or a record was getting radio play which then draws attention to the peripheral to and the other stuff that's on the records and then um then it went from that to doing a tv show and realizing the power of a big network tv show that had on creating additional interests and eyes and ears, you know, listen to what you're doing. People dig into a little bit deeper. What was the first TV show? Oh, geez, I don't remember. First TV show? Was it Sullivan or somebody else? No, 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 no. We did a bunch of them before that. You know, you, you know um, but Sullivan was high impact. Yeah three TV networks at that time. And when you did eight o'clock Sunday night, the world was looking at that, you know, and it just was a big impact. Yeah. yeah, no, I remember growing up as a kid at Sullivan, my dad always watched it. Yeah, yeah I remember <laughs> oh, seeing, seeing Elvis Presley for the first time on uh, Sullivan, seeing the Beatles. You know. Yeah. Um, so you started playing bigger venues and yeah and then uh right on the heels of that was this one life life yeah um this one i guess didn't have a hit as big as dance to the music no but did did it did this one still sell pretty well it did it did, it did pretty well but we didn't have like a hit but later on the songs became more relevant more relevant they were part of our live show 
And um, uh, I was going to say something. Something you said, and I, I lost it. <laughs> TV, a t TV appearances, or yeah. Um, oh, okay. And because we were speaking of, you know, I was speaking of making records and then playing live, and the, you know, it requires a different approach, maybe sometimes in, in making certain songs work live. Then there was the realization of of uh, performing in small venues, clubs. Then we would go on to do a big auditorium. You had to take maybe something that worked in the club, didn't necessarily work in that big, huge cavity, you know, the big sound system and everything. So it was a constant, um, we paid attention to that, you know, and I think that's what, what was one of the things that made the group such a powerful live performance group, is that we were conscious of that. And we, we, you, know, you, know, you just, you're just feeling, you're feeling what, uh, how audience is responding, how, what it feels like at the moment you're doing it, you know, and if you, if you pay attention to it, um, it can make a big difference adjusting to whatever, it's demanding, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you would tailor, well, you, the band would tailor its sound, but mm -hmm. did you actually uh, change your drum style a little bit, your drum approach, or did you use a, a bigger kit if you were in a bigger venue, or how'd you do that? I wouldn't necessarily change style, but approach, definitely. Yeah. And even maybe in the content of what you play, I mean, you know, uh, Maybe in a smaller venue, there would be things you could do that were more articulate and it meant something. When you get into that big space, all that little stuff gets lost. So, and, you know, you're always searching to make the song land and make it connect and make it mean something at that moment. So you'd have to pay attention to that and respond to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next record was a landmark for sure. Um, this one, tremendous. Yeah. Um, just to remind everybody uh, some of the songs that were on this, I Want to Take You Higher, Sing a Simple Song, Everyday People, You Can Make It If You Try. This by itself is like a greatest hits package. Mm -hmm. did, 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 did you guys know like how much you were on to something with this one? Well, we, when we go into the studio and each, each album, um, you know, what you achieved and, and what you had to, what your challenges were, you know, again, we were paying close attention to a lot. So we would conquer these, these challenges. So that one is exactly what it is. It's a, the culmination of, um, of the first three albums and what we've learned, uh, how you're keep on trying to, hone your craft better, whether it be songwriting or arrangements or performance. So it's a natural progress, you know. And I remember it being said that um, a record company will bet on your, the, the place, you know, the bet three records. You know, you could, you could flop a first one or maybe even a second one, but by the third one, you better be getting it right. And I think we did probably did better than get it right there. Yeah. Nowadays, I don't even think they have patience for for two. <laughs> it's in the world. It, that, there's no. There's really no. I don't think there's any parallels, except for, you know, some of the things are. I, I guess there are some similarities in the way you know, there's an artist or a group. You got to create your fan base. You got to be relevant. You got to be visible. You know, all those things are the same. How you get to them. Probably the mechanics are, or different. Yeah. I mean, you could do that now without having to to partner up with a big, huge labor. Right. That's resources. You could be visible on the internet. I mean, if you have something that's that touches people uh, quickly, or you know. But then again, you you need to be visible about uh, over and above the millions of others that are have that same access. So it, it almost becomes the same game, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. It is similar. Yeah. So 
Greg, when you guys um, were in the studio for all those other records and this one too, uh, talk to me a little bit about what it might have been like. What what would uh, I have seen and experienced if I had been hanging out in that studio when this was being created? You know, how did Sly lead the band? Who else really kind of led things, and how did the process go? It was. It, I think throughout the whole thing was, it, except till way later on, like when Sly moved to LA and he had the studio in the house and the group started becoming splintered and stuff. That's when it changed. But up until this time, uh, with Stan, it was pretty much the same process. Um, the as far as my experience, um, and it'll probably be interesting to know that. I would cut the drums always on all these, all the singles that were released, not necessarily the album cuts, but especially all the singles. Uh, I would go in and cut the drums as the last thing. In other words, I'd, we'd cut the tracks, the drums would be there, the songs would develop and morph into what they're going to be. And then I would again go back in the studio and overdub the, tr the drum track and really tighten it up to this something that wasn't there at the very beginning. I mean, the track was there and all that, but now you got all the overdubs on this the lyrics, the, the phrasing, and you know, of, 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 of the horn parts and everything. Sometimes it would require um, to make it be all it could be, changing things a little bit and just really focusing in and honing in on what this became. So I'd cut the track, the drum tracks again, and then, then it was mixed. And all the singles were done like that. So, so, that, so that didn't exist in the very beginning, uh -huh. you know, to answer your question. So that was probably one of the biggest changes. I and mean, that was just, that was just it, our process in making our records the best that they could be. So did Sly kind of like leave it up to most of the members to kind of uh, come up with their own parts and you know how much um, did he or anyone change the arrangements and that kind of stuff? He would. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of leeway and and uh, and openness to creativity and to us and to, and to our interpretation. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why the songs were. Why they were what they were, you know, those songs. So yeah, to answer the question, it would, it would be an open. And once in a while, I mean, sometimes you would have a specific idea about something, but usually, it, you would leave it up to this individual. And I guess we're right in that about in that time frame of of Woodstock, right? So, um, my wife, believe it or not, was at Woodstock as a toddler. Her uh, mom was there so she remembers nothing about it yeah. um but uh of course uh, it's so legendary and we've seen so many things on it and i was a small kid at that time so you know i didn't know about it at the time but what was it like being part of that incredible experience and has it been over romanticized or was it really all that it was all that it's amazing that that it, it that it is all that, meaning that, you know, it was pretty intense when it happened. You could feel this is really something different. This is really something special. You could feel all that. But to the extent that it lived on into history, and I mean, people still talk about it to this day, mostly as legend, because, you know, you, you find less and less people that were actually there as time goes on. And, uh, that that I find amazing, but it I think it deserved that status. I mean, you felt you were at something different and something historical in real time you know, when it happened. There's sometimes, you know, legend is leg, legend is created maybe outside of the realm of reality of whatever it was. You know, but not in this case. What were some of the things that were going through your mind, uh, if you recall, like when that 
I guess first when you kind of first saw what it was, and then when you were actually up there, you guys were kicking butt, and uh, and then also uh, afterwards. Well, I mean, you know, obviously, and I've told the story so many times of coming over the hill in the helicopter and seeing this sea of people and not even realizing what that was at first, you know, and uh, and then landing and I mean, you could feel the energy, you could feel this unique moment in time uh, to where the challenge of the challenge of um, the performance meaning that we were supposed to go on at 8 p.m. in that evening on Saturday and that we didn't end up going on until 3 a.m. Not because of uh, anything of our fault, just because the show was running behind and you know, that kind of stuff. So, but that was a challenge for us because you're, you know, you're, you, 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 you psych yourself to do a show, especially th this is like, oh, this is intense. You know, I mean, the first time anybody ever played for any of the artists for that many people. I mean, this was a unique moment. So you got that adrenaline happening. And then, uh, so, you know, Michael Lang kept coming in and, and asking for another hour, another hour, another hour, and up and up, down, up, down, up, down. And, and uh, you know, you know when it really comes out. Okay, we're going to go on now. I, I remember we all had just we were set back at the thought that you know we're like you know uh, just handling you know our adrenaline to go out to perform and 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 being ready and then ask to hold off and being ready and ask to hold off and the fact that all those people were there since um, this is Saturday evening, right? And they were there since I think Thursday, uh, day, night, loud, soft, raining, mud, sun, hot. They're beat up, <laughs> and we got to go out and perform. And it had just it had was raining just, just before we went on. Luckily, it, it stopped. But all these people were like just you know. And again, I said this. I don't know how many times I told the story, but it's very true. They were sleeping. You know, they were in their sleeping bags and. Like enough already, right? And so I remember we all had the, the, the thought of, uh, oh, we got to go on and, and pull this off, you know, and, and just come finally realizing that all we could do is go out and, and, and give it all. And so we all kind of like just, you know, grabbed each other's hands and looked at each other and just, okay, this is what we're going to do. And went out and took the challenge, and it was phenomenal. Uh, it, it took a couple songs into the set and then we got everybody into it. And you could feel the energy when you look at the movie still, which is unusual. You, sometimes those things don't come across in film or recording, but it's just, it's all there. Oh, yeah. I want to take yeah. you higher. It's just incredible. Yeah. Did you guys stick to the uh, planned set list or uh, did you alter it at all? I don't. I don't even. I, I don't remember that we had a set list. You know, we we did that, okay, but not all the time. And by this time, we were pretty much improvised. I mean, we you know there was a kind of a, a a set that worked. You know, a series of songs that worked when we knew we were going to do those songs, but it wasn't necessarily in and always strictly in an order. And so that was another thing that was cool about the shows is just you know fly would just you just we had to all watch each other at all times you know you had to be there it wasn't like okay just, you know you're gonna do this song next and just kind of be there into your own thing we're all like i mean when we went when we hit the stage we we're all connected as one entity mm -hmm. and um which is exciting because you're, you're doing it for the moment all the time yeah so, wow. then it came across to the it was, it was exciting because the audience you could feel that you could kind of sense that you know it's not like well this you almost could predict what's going to happen next you couldn't you know and so it kept it exciting 